Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Parkinson's webinar of 2024. My name is Geiger Hastis, and I'm the head of the Parkinson's Academy and chair for this afternoon's session. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Zambon UK Limited, for supporting this afternoon's learning. On this International Women's Day, I'm delighted to be joined by Emma Edwards, who will talk about suicide in relation to Parkinson's and how you can support your patients as well as yourselves. So without any further delay, let me hand you over to Emma to start this afternoon's session. Emma, over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Emma Edwards. I'm a Parkinson's specialist nurse in Plymouth. And that's a picture of Plymouth there. Um, I've been a Parkinson's nurse for about 14 years now, but I'm a mental health nurse by trade and have been since, oh my gosh, 1993. Well, oh my, that sounds a very long time ago. Um, however, the last couple of years, and I've just recently come back from a secondment, um, I've, I've been a, a, a suicide awareness trainer. Um, and it's something that came about um, after I lost a patient to suicide. Um, a Parkinson's patient, and I was really quite interested in finding out more. So just a couple of declarations, um, as always. Um, oh, gosh, let me just go back. Um, I'm um, Bial and Abvi and some lovely people from the Neurology Academy have funded my plant addiction for the last few years, which I'm forever grateful for. Um, and a quick shout out, I'm also a trustee on Spotlight YOPD, which is a, a national charity for people um, that are diagnosed with Parkinson's under the age of 50, and I'm some various bits and pieces elsewhere. But the aims of today's session is very much looking at um, suicide very broadly. So we're going to look at globally, nationally, then we're going to have a look at what it's... Um, the link between suicide and neurology and then we're going to drill that down to Parkinson's. Then I'm going to give you some ideas about um, why we should ask people with Parkinson's if they are feeling suicidal um, and I'm going to give you some helpful questions to ask and then some signposting. So what do we do with the answer when we get it and then the importance, if we've got a bit of time, just the, the importance of looking after your own mental health. So in terms of globally, it's estimated that there's around 700,000 people that take their life every year. The figure's probably much higher than that, um, but there, are, I think there are, um, there's 198, no, 185 countries in the world, and there's around about 100 that have a coronial process. So getting actual accurate data is really, really difficult, but it's about, it's probably more than a, a, around a million um, but the um, World Health Organization sits around this figure. So that's in 2019, that accounted for one in every 100 deaths, um, which is really quite massive. And, uh, you know, I think a, quite a, a public health issue. We'll talk about this a little bit more about the risk of men in suicide. But globally, men are um, twice as likely to take their life than women. Um, most suicides when we look at it globally that 703,000 figure most of that number comes from low um, and middle income countries however no country in the world um, escapes people dying by this way um, and it's still illegal unbelievably suicide is still illegal in in this country in the UK we decriminalized um, suicide in 1961 but there's still many countries um, across the world that um, this is illegal and you could potentially go to prison for. No more in Europe, though. But what's the picture in, in this country, in the UK? So the suicide figures are always a little bit behind because it takes a, a while to um, collate accurate figures from the coronial system, the coroner's courts. But in the UK, there was about six and a half thousand um, suicides registered in 2022. And that equates to about 115 people a week. Now, remember I was saying about men being more likely to take their life? Well, this is very similar in this country. In fact, they're three times more likely um, than women to take um, to, to die by suicide. Again, there is no age group that is not affected by this, unfortunately. However, the Generation Xs amongst us, those that were born in the 60s and 70s, 
we're particularly vulnerable. And a new study that came out just a couple of weeks ago, actually, said there was a rise in the over 90s. So again, another age group to watch out for. And methods do change with age. So um, younger people will often um, um, sort of favour cutting, hanging, um, 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 quite inventive ways. Middle-aged men, for example, suicide is the most common way. As people get older, overdosing on um, on prescribed medication is not uncommon. So it, it, it's something um, that I think is, is significant, especially when we start thinking about suicide prevention. Now, MIND, the charity, did a study um, a few years ago looking at, and, and it was a huge population they, um, they looked at in the UK, about how many of us have suicidal thoughts. And they came back with one in five people. So I really do think this... This is a phenomenon that is part of the human condition and geography matters. And I hadn't really appreciated this, actually, until I started becoming a, a delving into this as a suicide awareness trainer. It's higher. So the northeast, the northwest of the UK have much higher figures of suicide. Um, and they have been for a long, long time. And London, out of the whole of the UK, have the lowest figures. Which I find interesting anyway. In terms of age and gender, this this is um, a, a graph here from the Office of National Statistics, and it's the latest one that I could find. And the green bars represent men, and the orangey yellow bars represent women. And we can see here nearly in every age group, the men three times more likely than women. But what we can see is that middle-aged men, as I said, those Generation Xs and women have the highest rate of suicide but this is a new thing this 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 graph looks very different from last year in terms of the over 90s um of course there are less over 90s than there are middle-aged people but we can see that um there's a spike and that's something certainly that suicidologists around the country will be watching there are many reasons why people take their life um, or think about it Often it's the result of accumulative stress. So there are events that are happening to people that build up over weeks, months, years that then may lead to those suicidal thoughts and acts. So these are some really common risk factors that we see across the world, actually, not just in the UK, but people that have a physical illness, neurological illnesses is there. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Relationship problems. A lot of people, especially in that middle age category, are single or they're divorcing or breaking up with somebody in later life. It's people that are widowed. So often single or in relationships that are um, um, uh, tr troublesome. Um, people that have a mental health condition. So you won't be surprised to hear that depression and psychosis play a large part in, in, in bipolar conditions. Um, actually, um, having previous suicidal um, suicide attempts increases that risk factor of suicide. But there are also these warning signs, again, that we, we it's important to sort of know the signs. And I'm going to go into a bit more depth about that in terms of Parkinson's. But people feeling isolated, people feeling a burden, people um, with unhealthy coping strategies, people that have a, a feel that have a, a very negative view of themselves um, people that sort of hint um, about death so these are common warning signs but again we'll look at that shortly um, again now Thomas Joyner again I did not know this sort of community of suicidologists existed before I started um, sort of delving into it. It's Thomas Joyner is probably one of the most famous suicidologists in the in the world. Um, his dad unfortunately took his life and this is where it, it sort of took his um took his interest. And he's done he interviewed thousands and thousands of people over the years. Um, and he came up with this interpersonal theory of suicide. So he said one of the most common sort of factors that that are present when someone has suicidal thoughts or are about to embark on a suicidal act, are these three things or four things really? This feeling of being alone, of being rejected, not not fitting in. He called it thwarted belongingness. I love the word thwarted. We don't use that enough in in our English language, I don't think. So that I am alone. 
but also this burdensomeness. So really not bringing much to the party anymore, not feeling um, like you're giving much back um, and also having that capability of suicide. So not only access to means, um, but the, 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 you know, you're physically able to take your life. And of course, that desire to die. And he says, when these things are sort of in place, um, the risk of suicide goes up a lot higher. And so the way that he looks at suicide prevention is that if we can kind of manage and put mitigation around these areas, then the risk of suicide um, will come down. So in terms of suicide and neurological conditions, we know, um, and I went to a, a rather fabulous neurological transformation meeting in Birmingham this year, put on by the Neurolog um, Neurology Academy, that one in six people in the UK have a neurological condition. So I think it's important that we are aware that this risk exists. So there's, there's various um, bits um, studies out there. And this was a really great one I found from Erlingsing from, um, two, I think it was 2000, yeah, uh, 2020, sorry. Um, and she looked at um, a population study of neurological, um, different neurological diseases and those that died from suicide. And what she came out with and her, and her gang um, was that suicide, that people with neurological conditions were more at risk than suicide than perhaps that of the general population. And it was people, the, the, the neurological conditions that featured highly were Huntington's, motor neuron disease, MS. Parkinson's was there, but sort of lower down the line in terms of numbers. Now, I wanted to find out after my patient died of suicide, I was really um, interested to find out what the research was in this country. And there was virtually nothing. Um, there were studies from a, um, abroad, and I'll go into that in a moment, that looked quite a lot at sort of population figures. But still, there was a, a, a gap in why people might do this. Um, and there still is. But there was one study. There was one study from um, 2018, and that was Parkinson's UK. And it was part of a bigger study looking at mental health needs um, and Parkinson's. I think it was like an all parliamentary committee type paper. And they asked um, various questions on this survey. And it was about 800 people that came and um, answered that. And one of the questions was, Had, have you ever experienced suicidal thoughts? And over a, a third of people responded saying yes. And it was unfortunate in some ways that, that this wasn't picked up and ran with because I, I've done various literature reviews trying to find why this might happen in this country. And I, I've just not found anything. So I just thought, well, I'll do it myself then. Put the big girl pants on and let's have a look and see what I can find. So I asked the Office of National Statistics um, how many people with Parkinson's die every year that have um, um, uh, die by suicide that have Parkinson's on their death certificate. This cost me £150 just in case you ever want to find out data from them. Um, they do charge. Um, and what they came back with was between um, uh, within a, a time frame of 2011 and 2021 that 45 people had this. But what they said, which was I found really interesting, is that it will probably be a lot higher than that, actually, because there is a, um, and, and this is just not with Parkinson's, but can other conditions are not always put on the death certificate. So Parkinson's are not, is not always registered on there. So it's a, so the Office of National Statistics said they thought that this could be higher but it was 45 people. And this was, sorry, this was um, in England and Wales they looked at. But there was, um, a, since I asked that question, um, there was a real, again, another sort of population study done from um, um, Taiwan. And this one sort of got legs. And this, this one was reported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Parkinson's Europe. And it was um, their sort of findings that they felt that, um, 
you were um, if you had Parkinson's, you were twice as more likely to take your life than the general population. And that kind of makes it kind of made sense to me. Because there's lots of crossovers, isn't there, with the broad demographics? And I sort of highlight a few, you know, we, we have a lot of people with Parkinson's that get very depressed and anxious. They may be living by themselves because they're older and they may have lost their, their partner. Um, so I thought I wondered if that made them a high risk group. But what I always love, and I'm sure you do as well, is when you're looking at these um, looking Francis, if, some, if someone has done a really cohesive literature search for you, and I found one, it was by Shepherd um, and, and her um, et al in, in 2019. Um, so they had looked at all the studies they could find, none of them were from the UK, by the way, on the common factors um, for suicidality and Parkinson's. So they, they found similar similar sort of crossovers in the fact that more were male, white, um, and, and what we know in this country is it tends to be more white people that take their life. They were suffering with um, uh, depression or they had this background of depression, bipolar disorder, um, perhaps using unhealthy coping mechanisms such as alcohol, or substances, and we get again sort of broadly in this country. We know that fifty percent of people that take their life have alcohol and sub, um, substance misuse in the background. Also, some um, some people with psychosis. Again, that sort of previous self harm attempt um, or, or suicide attempt. Um, maybe other medical illnesses. Living in a rural area, but this was different. This was the one that stood out for me. As I've seen before, um, often relationship problems um, or difficulties or being single or being widowed feature highly in people that are feeling suicidal. Um, but for people with Parkinson's, there were more that were married. And that, I, that was significant, I think. And I think it relates to the burdensomeness. If you remember back to... Um, Tom Thomas Joyner that we just had a look at his sort of interlocking circles there. What they also found is that um, the the suicide the people that were dying by suicide were older than your average suicide victim. So again, this is um, middle aged people. So in Canada and America, especially, they, they're very sort of similar stats to us in terms of. They are the biggest risk people, but they were younger than people that were dying naturally of Parkinson's. And that I found this interesting, and I think it, it, it sort of challenged my bias. I assumed that it would be people that were quite, um, that were in the more advanced stages of Parkinson's, but that actually wasn't always a factor. But something about motor fluctuations, and, and hopefully this will kind of link in with Kelly's later, sort of um, discussion about why getting the medications right is really important. Um, so when it was perceived that medications were not adequately controlling sim um, symptoms, this seemed to be a feature. So I'm doing a, a, a chief nurse research fellow um, ship at the moment. And what I've been doing is trying to track those 45 people that um, the ONS told me had taken their life in the last 10 years. And that's, it's been incredibly challenging, actually. And I've been looking, I've been trying to find them through online coroner's reports. And so far, I've, I found about 13. There's always a bit of a risk, isn't there, by sort of sharing research at midpoint. Um, but as I was looking for this, I did find that only 11% of um, um, suicides are reported um, in the media, which was frustrating. Anyway, so I found 13. Nine of these people were married. So again, that, that higher number married than perhaps we would find in, in other um, sort of people that have died by suicide. The majority were male. Um, and this was very interesting. They, they were often incredibly well-planned suicides. So the, the, they were um, sitting in a house and burning the house around you. They were floating out to sea on your back. There was two boats that did that. There was rigging up really elaborate um, 
um, sort of uh, electrical devices to kill yourself. They, uh, they were jumping off of cliffs. They were jump going, driving to the um, neurology level at the hospital and jumping down the stairwell. There was no coming back from these these attempts. Um, and I, again, it, 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 perhaps I shouldn't read too much into that, having not knowing. Uh, the, the full picture of the 45, but it was something that stood out in nearly every single one that I've looked at. This I found interesting. Um, more than half of the people that I found died within a few years of getting that diagnosis. And this kept coming up time and time again in the coroner's reports. These people were experiencing pain. They were experiencing their first falls or mobility problems. A few had caring roles themselves, often looking after people with dementia. Um, but in nearly all cases, they were worried about how this disease progressed. And in a few, which again, personally, I find interesting because I've had this experience recently, is that they mentioned about going to Dignitas or they had researched online going to Dignitas or a similar a similar um, um, clinic or they had mentioned that if things got too bad, it's sort of almost this red line that they would go to Dignitas. Now, Dignitas, actually, if you know anything about it, and again, <clears throat> fell down a rabbit hole looking at this one night, um, it's, it, it's pretty cheap to join, 280-odd quid, um, but to actually get there, do the deed, get your body thrown, um, flown back is incredibly expensive. So. It's about, well, let me take you on to why perhaps or barriers of why clinicians might not delve into people's mental health problems. Now, there is, like I said, there's very, very little research in why this might happen with Parkinson's clinicians. But there is, there is quite a bit of research out there about other healthcare and social care um, clinicians. So one a really common myth, and again, when I was doing my training, mental health nurses and clinicians were, were, were sort of saying, one of the reasons I don't ask is because, you know, it, it might put the idea in their head. Do you know it, it won't? That is a big myth. Another one is about, and I think I wonder if I held this, is that older people don't think about it. Now, we know when we speak to older people's mental health teams and psychiatrists, we know that's not the case when you think back to that slide of, you know, the 90 year olds taking their life. Um, so we know that's a myth. Why should I ask my patients not depressed? Again, what we know from the figures, what we know from the research broadly is that, yes, depression does feature heavily. The National Confidential Inquiry, in, Inquiry into Suicides and Homicides, which is a big research project that's been going for about 25 years now from the University of Manchester. They look at um, people that died by suicide that were under mental health services. And actually, it only accounts for 27 percent of the, like, the overall picture of suicides in the UK. Um, another third of people are, are under their GPs. They're known to primary care services. But there's a third of people that we don't know, you know, we, we don't know if they're depressed. And I think that reflects the, the, the reasons for why people might want to take their life, this accumulative stress. So it's, you know, it might be money and then you lose your job and then your wife walks out on you and you don't see your kids and you're drinking too much and your friends don't want to hang out with you. You know, it's this accumulative stress you know, which can make you very depressed, but it doesn't necessarily um, follow with a, 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 a sort of a, a diagnosis of depression always. I don't have enough time to ask. Actually, when I when, when my patient first well, that, that patient died in 2019, that was on my caseload. I asked his consultant, um, why did, did, do we ask? Do, should, do you ask about suicide? He said, I just don't have the time to do it. I'll be absolutely honest with you. And he also said, I don't know what I would have done with the answer if I had asked. So I think that is really, really common and certainly something I've had fed back to me lots of times. It's not my job. You know, I'm a neurologist. I'm a Parkinson's nurse. I'm not a mental health nurse. I am. Um, there's a massive stigma 
around the subject of suicide. Um, and there's many reasons why people might not offer it up to say that I'm feeling that way. But also from the clinician's point of view, compassion fatigue. You know, we work in a really, really stressful environment. Um, I remember going to the RCN Congress the year before last and nurses time and time again coming up on the podium saying that they were, you know, finding it really difficult to, to build relationships with their patients because they were feeling so sort of unwell and um, overworked and stressed themselves. Another reason might be mental, you know, if I ask, where am I going to send them on to? You know, there's no mental health teams out there. There's no, um, you know, it's a long wait for psychology, um, which I think there's a bit of truth in there. But mental health services do exist. Emergency crisis mental health lines do exist. So there are um, um, resources out there. It's half the time. It's knowing what is out there. And I have to put this one in there. We know that nurses and doctors and healthcare professionals, we are high risk of stress. We are high risk as well as a professions um, of suicide ourselves. So it may be that people don't ask because they've, they've experienced themselves, they might be going through it. Um, so it's incredibly, a, it's a very complex and delicate subject. But why should you ask? Because this could be potentially life-saving. The parity of esteem. Um, now, I was taught this as a mental health nurse years and years ago. And we know we know this, this should be right. So mental health being held in the same estimations as physical health. So if you had a patient that came into your clinic or you went to see them at home and they said, do you know what? I've been having this chest pain. Well, you take their blood pressure and it's 180 over 120. Um, you wouldn't ignore that, would you? Um, that would be significant to act upon. So if if someone is saying they're struggling with their mental health, this is something that we should be doing something about. And that intense emotional pain that often people with suicidal thoughts experience, it can be supported, it can be treated, but it's bloody hard to live with. Why should we do it? because the NICE guidelines say we should as well. So the NICE guidelines for Parkinson's came out in 2017. I'm sure you all have um, memorized it. So for depression, the, the, the section on how do we treat depression in people with Parkinson's, because, you know, it's such, you know, it's a common non motor symptom that we come across. There's like one line in that whole of that document. And that one line refers you to a 10 year old document about chronic physical health conditions and depression. And in that, it says that it's very high. Um, people with um, chronic physical illnesses have high risk of depression. And that if we have them on our case, like, we should be asking about their mood. And if it flags up that they're depressed, we should be asking whether they have suicidal thoughts. So it's not just me saying and banging this onto you. The nice guidelines tell you to do it. Now, we know as well, and the research shows that there was a brilliant, oh, I think it was Baz Bloom's, one of Baz Bloom's studies, was saying, was it about one or two percent of the time, non-motor symptom um, issues are, are raised by our patients. They're rarely volunteered. So we need to ask. Um, and at the end of the day, who else is going to do it? We know that appointments are few and far between for our patients. Um, so we should be checking this out. So when do we ask it? So I am not saying you need to ask every person you come along, come across, whether they have suicidal thoughts or they have thoughts to harm themselves. Absolutely not. But I think if you know the red flags, if you know those risk signs, so people with depression, people with bipolar, previous attempts, um, if they start feeling, um, start talking about feeling really trapped in the situation, these are red flags that we need to act upon and perhaps start asking um, if the patient says that they're suicidal, even if it's vague threat. Um, if they're bringing that up, we need to ask some more questions. If their family are worried about their mental health. Um, I always remember Peter Fletcher saying years ago in, in one of his talks, I always 
when the daughter starts emailing me, I know there's a big problem. Um, so what, do not sort of dismiss these sort of um, these these worries from families. Again, as I've said, you know, if the patient is depressed, if they're anxious, you know, I, I see so many patients that are on antidepressants. You know, I, I, I kind of feel that's also our job to kind of just check to make sure that they're OK. If there is a sudden change in their mental health pre presentation. So by that, I mean, you know, if they've suddenly become very depressed or they've suddenly someone that was very, very depressed suddenly becomes um, um, very calm and or hypermanic. Um, you know, we need to delve a bit deeper. Now, there, this is mine. This is not based on any research because the research has not been done in Parkinson's um, other than a few little sort of sort of paragraphs here and there in some research. But I really do think, you know, if if our patients are suffering with those impulsive, compulsive disorders that we get from side effects of medication, you know, if they're hypersexual, that puts massive pressure on relationships. Um, if they're gambling away, you know, all their savings, these things, you know, people with financial problems are particularly high risk of, of suicide. So it's worth asking. Um, and if they start talking about assisted dying or telling you or, or they told somebody else about um, that they're looking at Dignitas, I think it's worth, again, finding out a little bit more. And there is nothing, you know, that that sort of replaces that gut instinct as well. So how do you ask about it? Now, I really do think this is not a question you would just immediately go up. So, hello, Mrs. Smith, are you suicidal? You need to get that rapport established first. Always, always with compassion and authenticity. And, yeah, we bandy that around, don't we, a lot. But people that are feeling very vulnerable will know sort of instinctively if they can open up. So it's about always, isn't it, about, you know, being with a person with compassion. And I think it's with confidence as well, because this is a this is a tricky subject to broach and it's a tricky subject sometimes to answer. So it's to do it with confidence and to do it clearly. Now, this is a question or this phrase is how I phrase it. Um, and it's never failed me yet. So I say it is quite normal for us, especially if we're depressed or we feel very trapped or we're um, feeling high levels of emotional pain to have thoughts of taking our own life. Is that happening to you? And that's the question. That is the question. Um, and I, I, it's like I said, it's never failed me. And, and people may say, absolutely not. No. Um, people may say, do you know what it, I did actually when I was first diagnosed, but I feel OK now. Um, or they may say, do you know what this is happening every day? I'm waking up feeling like this. Um, so it's a really helpful question. Sometimes the double ask um, is helpful. And that is, you know, when we say, are you all right? Often people will say, yeah, I'm fine. Um, but if you ask again, are you OK? That often gets the more authentic response. So that's that's another sort of a top tip. But as I said, asking the question will not put their idea, the idea of suicide in their head. There is no evidence that we can find that supports that. Um, and there's no point using a suicide risk assessment tool. Anything that comes out with high, low or medium is absolute a waste of time. Research has shown it's only 5% right um, um, most of the time. You, you might as well just put it in the bin. There is no, because suicide is so complex. There are so many reasons why people do it and don't do it. And that's often out of our control. So it may kind of reassure you that somebody's come out as low risk but in fact just leaving that building and something might happen you know significantly or even something very innocuous that might make them change their mind so they've said yes what do you do now I always think I, I love this picture and I love the next picture I always wonder what I look like when somebody says actually um, yes I, I have had these thoughts I'm hoping that I don't look like um the, uh, the 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 sheriff from from Jaws, but don't panic, don't downplay it. So if they say yes, I have been having these thoughts, don't make them feel guilty. Don't say, look, you cannot do this to me. Um, think of all the family you would leave behind. Those that's not a helpful statement. Um, continue to be compassionate and empathetic. So continue to kind of 
well, gosh, that must be absolutely terrible to feel like that. And I think if they are saying they're imminently going to take their life, um, I don't think you need to carry on with the rest of your assessment. If somebody came in with crushing chest pain, you would not be sitting there asking them about their bowels and asking them to do the finger tap test. You would be acting on it. And I think, again, think back to that parity of esteem. I think if somebody is coming into your clinic, and I think it's going to be incredibly rare, but they do, um, but you wouldn't need to carry on. You would need to be sort of acting on this. So what are some more questions that you might be able to ask? Um, so we're not asking you to um, do a full mental health assessment. The NICE guidelines say, you know, ask a few more questions, but then refer on to a service or a, a, a clinician that can do a more in-depth assessment. But the more information that you have, the richer the assessment to refer on to, uh, the richer the referral is, sorry. So I often will ask, you know, how long have you felt like this? How long um, have you told anyone else that you're feeling like this? What is making you feel like this? And this is quite important. So I asked this question the other day to a, a, a chap and he said, I am, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm gonna kill myself because I've heard that I'm gonna lose control of my bowels in advanced Parkinson's. So we dug into that. Um, we, we looked at bladder and bowel function and we put some advanced care planning and then he did not feel so fearful about the future. Um, so there's stuff that you could do straight there and then. Um, have you made any plans? And this is really helpful to find out um, because that's going to um, sort of indicate what you do next. And maybe you know, some people live with these chronic suicidal thoughts. So what helps them? But a really important thing to find out is if they've done anything already to hurt themselves. I mean, we haven't got time to go into protective factors. And plus, we really don't know much about it in Parkinson's. But just don't assume because they've got a family that that is going to be enough for them not to go through with the act. So what do you do next? Always offer reassurance and hope. When you are hopeless, I can see why you just wouldn't want to go on. So hope in that people have felt like this before. So many people have felt in, in those, those feelings you're experiencing and they've got better. You know, so offer hope and always offer a response, but it might be different to what is presented in front of you. So if they've already done something, if they've already said, I've taken 100 paracetamol, which I think is going to be so rare, you need to get another medical attention. If they have very active thoughts with immediate plans, you're going to need to do something about that there and then. And that might be sending them to the emergency department where mental health nurses and doctors are. Or it may be that you speak to your local mental health crisis line, but there will be people to kind of guide you on this. If there are general thoughts, but you feel the risk um, is manageable, that, you know, they've said, I'm not going to go through with this, but it does, it does play on my mind at times. It's about um, referring them on for further assessment and support. It may be that you're giving them the, the number of the crisis line. It may be Samaritans from April this year. Um, if, if somebody rings 111, they will automatically be put through um, after their little assessment and triage. They'll be put through to their local mental health crisis line. Um, it might be that you refer on to... Um, um, voluntary groups and you know charitable groups and you know there's a big uh, suicide government act plan that came out um, at the beginning of the year that again urges clinic clinicians to know those charities that are around us because often that you can get into them quicker than you can get into mental health services and obviously document this um, and notify the relevant people so I know I'm sort of coming up I've just got the last couple of minutes here so I think, and this is, my, this is my theory, but this is sort of based on wider physical health issues and Parkinson's and, uh, and what I've read and what I know already. I just wonder whether we're already doing sort of suicide prevention stuff and not knowing. So remember Thomas Joyner's interpersonal model there. I think it is so important about the, the importance of advanced care planning. Um, and it's important here about managing fears of advanced Parkinson's. So again, if they're worried that they're going um, to have these 
all, all sort of symptoms, you know, we can say that actually, do you know what, we can do something about that. Um, you know, and I know like Ed Richfield talks about the importance of Ed, of, of the fancy planning and how that can kind of bring down anxieties as well. So again, important, you're probably doing it already, the importance of social connection. So we often refer people to Parkinson's groups, don't we? We love the exercise, but, you know, we know that's important for people, but all of these things are good for mental health as well. Manage the burdensomeness. So, um, you know, when I listen to um, um, Dr. Camille Carroll, she talks about how people that are involved with research have these better health outcomes, don't they? And I think as well, it, it's altruistic. It's feeling like you're giving something to a, a, a wider sort of um, something higher than yourself support for carers early on absolutely um so that, that they feel um supported again actively screening for depression and um, dementia and psychosis again we do these things already um actively managing fluctuations in medication um, in in symptoms in um and, and medications responding when people are having falls and again this was something from my research that i was really surprised about but this plays on people's mind. This really significantly affects their mental health. Um, again, get that support in and education when people are newly diagnosed. Know who your financial debt agencies are. This is really, really helpful in this day and age. And of course, you know, we, um, we work in a wider MDT and that's always um, important to stress, isn't it? So my takeaway tips, don't be, a, don't be afraid to ask the difficult questions. Because if, if we don't do it, if we're not confident in that, um, we're, we're potentially going to miss something. But these people, but we know our patients don't, they have to wait long times to see professionals. Um, so don't be afraid to ask those difficult questions. I think, and we know from the, the research that suicide in Parkinson's is low, but it happens every year. Families are bereaved by suicide. Um, in, from people with Parkinson's every year, but it's going to be low. The chances you have this experience and your patient goes through this is going to be low. Um, but, you know, the chances of someone having a cardiac event in your clinic or at home is low, but we go on yearly training for, for basic life support, don't we? So um, most organisations have suicide awareness training. So I suggest if you are interested, in um, some kind of upping your skills in this is to attend that. Most organisations have a 24 hour mental health crisis number. Um, find it out. Like I said, from April, it will be 111. So that's easy to remember for you to give out to your patients. The Hub of Hope. So that is an, um, a website with all your local. So you just put in your where you live and it will come up with all the mental health organisations and charities in your area that might be useful for your patient. Continue to work as an MDT because, you know, um, if we have good connections with mental health teams, especially referring on is going to be helpful. I think the, um, the non-motor symptom questionnaire can be helpful. I've just said about not using sort of suicide questionnaires, but I think this opens the conversation if you did want to sort of ask a, a bit more about their mental health in in um in your assessments but i just want to end with this really I've, I've alluded to it already as as health and social care professionals we are high risk of suicide as a profession i've been there myself i've experienced these thoughts um and i was so lucky to be supported this was many years ago but i found i could not do my job properly um whilst i was in that headspace so it's about putting your oxygen mask on first. It's about looking after your own mental health. The Neurology Academy has some fantastic bite-sized webinars on health and well-being. But be aware of your stress levels. Be aware of your signs. Know your support around you. Um, and people really don't mind listening, you know, if you reach out. But if you are having thoughts of harming yourself or taking your life and you don't act on it, and my thoughts were very slow in building up. Um, this is your metaphorical crushing chest pain. This is not normal to feel like that. So please reach out to somebody. And the, the Laura Hyde Foundation is an amazing foundation 
for supporting healthcare professionals with their mental health. And do you know what? The good old Samaritans, they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they are a wonderful listening service. And practice what you preach. All those healthy coping mechanisms we, we, pra- we suggest for our patients, you know, sometimes putting that in action again can, can be really helpful. And that is me. So if, if you've got any questions, please do ask. But if you'd like to contact me at all, those are my contact details. I know from experience this, this, this talk can be a slow burner. So if you do have any questions and you want to get hold of me, please do. Thank you. Emma, thank you so very, very much for that um, very enlightening and passionate talk. Um, we have one question for you from Deborah Gallant. You, in all your research, did you find any links with um, deep brain stimulation and suicide? Yes, there is, and it's mixed. So the, the one high-quality study, and none of them are from the UK, by the way, um, one of the most high-quality studies that I could find actually showed that there was um, no increased risk. But there are several other studies um, that did show that there was a slight increased risk to it. So nothing saying that it was lower. Like I said, the best one said that there wasn't a, um, a link, but there were several others saying there, there, there was an increase afterwards. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, two people just saying what a fantastic talk it was. So thank you oh, very thank you. much to you.